INEC acts to disqualify or be over $150 million diaspora funding. And South South suffers leadership deficit across board, says retired diplomat Ambassador Joe Keshi. This is Plus Politics, and I'm Mary Anuko. A group under the aegis of Tinubu Shatima Connect has urged the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to disqualify the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, and his running mate. Ahmed Baba Dakti from the 2023 presidential race over violation of the Electoral Act on campaign funding. The group has also vowed to begin a legal action to prevent the Labour Party from participating in the 2023 presidential election for engaging in activities that contravene the Electoral Act. What's running us to discuss this is Kunle Lawal, he's the Executive Director of the Electoral College of Nigeria. It's so good to have you join us, Kunle. It's a pleasure. Um, let's start by laying the foundation. Let's go to what the Electoral Act has to say about this because... Um, we also have seen that several people have kicked against it. Several people are also in support of this group, even though um, this seems to be more of a party A versus party B. But what are your thoughts when you first heard about diaspora funding from former Governor Peter B? Okay, first, I need to make clear that every Nigerian president that has emerged has emerged with a lot of diaspora funding backing, from Obasanjo down to um, President Muhammad Buhari. Um, Section 85 of the Electoral Act 2022 is very clear. It states in um, Section A that parties cannot um, receive or have assets that are outside Nigeria. But, you know, coming down a little bit to when it goes to candidates, it is totally silent on candidates, and there's a clear reason. Candidates only have limits based on campaign funding, like the president has a limit of $5 billion, which is not supposed to exceed. And we can say a lot of pres presidential of the big parties have exceeded such amounts, which is in a, a violation of the Electoral Act. But, you know, coming down to Governor Anko, it just simply states candidates, and there's a reason why. If you, if you look at whoever came up with the Constitution, or whoever came up with the Electoral That's Act, right. and sat down and looked at this thing, it is so that foreign influence will not influence our part, political parties. Foreign influence cannot influence a candidate. It influencing, foreign influence influencing a candidate, a, a political party, therein lies the problem. And I'm surprised um, most lawyers, I think, maybe because they receive hitherto from different angles, are deciding to come up with funny ideas when, you, yeah. when it's, yeah, this particular talk is being mentioned. You raise a very important issue, especially with the big major political parties. Sometime in 2015, um, Serap had urged political parties to make their campaign finances public so that they could tell if they were exceeding or not. Well, in 2022, uh, that's still not being done. And INEC, um, Sarah Pabega, pardon, at some point, you know, decided that they were going to take the matter to court. I, don't, I do not know what the outcome of that has been, because here we are again, another campaign cycle, and then elections are going to happen. Why can't the books be opened? Um, I think the, mo the books can be opened, because, um, I'll be honest, um, senatorial limit, I believe, is, a, is 100 million. And I believe that has been cut down already from, if you look at how much candidates even spent on forms, like if you look at the presidential for the APC, it was 100 million. So you are already locking down your 5 billion limit. And that, that's just the form alone, minus every other thing that went down with it, the travels, the, the expenses. It, of course, will put us in a very dire corner. And I think nobody's ready to open the books. And because one person is not opening the book, that's incumbent party and the main opposition are not opening the books, I must say everybody else has shut their books because clearly everybody violates the Electoral Act on campaign financing in Nigeria. Why do we have an Electoral Act if we're going to violate it? 
But I mean, needlessly, like, because I mean, it's we made so much noise about this. We pushed for it. Now we have it, but then we're not we re reckless abandon. We're just saying oh, we don't care. We'll just do business as usual. The What's the essence? The problem in Nigeria has never been the laws that Nigeria has. The problem has been actually following the, lo the laws Nigeria has. So most people that do not understand the constitution will come up and tell you that the 99 constitution is just a piece of trash. But well, the truth is that the 99 constitution is not even followed up to 40% in Nigeria. That's interesting. Let's talk about if these political parties keep count, because you have said, you've mentioned so many things that somebody should be keeping account. Could it also be that nobody's keeping account and that's why these books are not open? I'm asking because we're asking for leaders who are going to be accountable to us, who will be responsible. If the political parties at that level are unwilling to show that level of accountability, why should we trust the politicians that they're fielding? I, I must say that whoever draft, uh, the draftsmen of, of this particular electoral act also understand under which parameters these, these uh, politicians function, so they left gaps. There's a limit with electoral funding, but it's so silent on who exactly should prosecute, whether I neck the police or anybody else. It doesn't state who will prosecute. It doesn't say who exactly will do what. But, you know, it just states, okay, nobody should exceed so so amount. Okay, nobody exceeds, and there's the fine, there's the fine for exceeding. There's the, there's the option that you might even be kicked out of the race if you exceed. But now, who exactly is going to do it? Every, there's lack of jurisdiction. And, uh, you know, nobody's even looking at this. And, you know, it's amazing when I hear senior advocates deciding to argue on things that don't matter. Hmm. Let's talk more about the diaspora funding issue. Now, there have been a push and a call for diaspora um, voting, which we haven't even been able to cross that threshold. Um, why do you think that former Governor Peter will be decided to go in that direction? Because we see that former, the, I'm so sorry, Mr. President, when he was still a candidate, asked Nigerians to support his election, and people gave as, as, as little as 500 naira. Um, why did Governor Obi not go in that direction? Why did he have to go in the direction of the diaspora? Is it because he's trying to give them a sense of belonging? What exactly is his angle? I, I'm, I know you're not him, but what do you think? Okay, so um, having been a candidate before, I think I'll make this clear. I was a candidate during 2019 elections. Um, 2015, we only seem to remember when um, the incumbent president decided to approach Nigerians and people were giving 500 naira. What do you think his conversation in the Chatham House was about? It was to influence Nigerians that lived in the UK to give to his campaign. Nigeria actually makes more money from Nigerians in diaspora than we do from crude oil right now, but they are not valid enough to be part of an electoral cycle that will dictate their leaders. That's a joke. And going into Peter Obi's mind, um, I think, first things, they are Nigerians. Second, he's not going to the Soviet Union, USSR, to go and ask for money. He's not going to the Israelis to ask for money. He's going to Nigerians that live in diaspora who have influence, who have relatives here, who also give to this country's GDP. So the, the, the actual thought process is if Nigeria is better, these people will want to come back. Obasanjo pulled the same card, which was why he was able to get a lot of people working in diaspora to join his government because mm -hmm. he made it a complete thing. So there's no presidential candidate. And if you're looking at 2019, Fela Durotoye was part of that. King Simo Galu was part of that. The incumbent president, President Muhammad Buhari, too, also sought uh, diaspora funds. There's no president in Nigeria that has not sought diaspora funds. I think why this is an issue is because Mr. Peter Obi has clearly shown he's not playing politics as usual. And there's a little fear that maybe the, the present traction which he's gaining is unsettling the status quo. Hmm. Let's talk. Let's zero in to Peter Albi now, because I'm just in passing. Prof Professor Patu told me, who is also a strong ally of the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, uh, has dared INEG to, <laughs> um, you know, on this issue of funding, to he's dared them to see if they could, you know, try to um, sort, sort what's the word now? Try to disqualify um, the governorship candidate. But that's on the one hand. But let's talk about the trajectory of the campaign of Governor Peter Obi and where it's going. Now, I have heard people say that his followers, and this many people, uh, might not be as smart as the man who they're trying to vote for. And this mostly owing to how they react on social media. But does that, is that what we should 
give as a generalization for all those who are hashtag obedient? Um, well, as regards the hashtag obedient, um, from a non-partisan perspective, which I represent, I would say what we saw in 2015 was far more bloody than what we're seeing right now. And How do you mean? Uh, 2015 was more with a trade of words, which were we cannot be used. I remember the incumbent president then, President Goodluck Jonathan, being depicted in a coffin. You know, it was, it was really bad. You had people that were political elite, one who's a present governor, accusing the, the president then of being part of um, Boko Haram and a lot of other things. So if there's, any, if there's any action right now being portrayed by the obedience, I will clearly say they were taught in 2015 by those who acted in 2015. But it's, again, I'm not in any way trying to put them on the chopping board, but we're talking about Peter Obi here and what he's going on, um, you know, how he's going on his political journey. Um, if we're saying that, or they're saying that this is a different kind of politicking. He's bringing a new Nigeria. This is a new movement away from the old. Why are you towing the same lines of mudslinging and dirty politics, in quote, uh, of 2015? How do we, how can we tell that you were, you're not the wheat and uh, rather you're the wheat and not the shaft? I need to say at this point that we have created the Nigeria we need. So politics at this point will only be fought like a tug of war to the People only understand one thing. I've clearly seen a side that clearly states that if you are not Yoruba, you are not standing with the sons of Yoruba. I've heard that, and I've seen that publicly. That's from the, uh, what I don't want to mention, but from a particular presidential candidate. We've seen people saying that um, if you're not with a, a, part, a, a party, that is, if you're not Northern, it's not your turn to rule. We've seen, I've seen all that. So I think why the obedience gets on everybody's nerve is that for once, it's not the usual suspects, meaning the usual social media influencers that are in control of the obedience. These are just normal Nigerians participating. And I think it upsets a lot of people. And for me, I think every other campaign should just face its campaign, do what it needs to do, convince the Nigerian people. We need to turn our politics ideological, and that goes across board for everybody. But I'm not justifying the fact that the obedience are reacting, uh, acting the way they do, as if, if they really act that way. But what I'm saying is what that... What do you mean if they really act that way? You don't think that... I mean, you've seen several non-partisan, we're talking about celebrities, we've seen people call them out. We've seen the professor, um, Annabelle Lorette, call them out and say, you cannot go this route. We've seen um, Femi Kuti, the likes, saying, well, we also have a right to decide who we want to follow. It's an election. It's open to everybody. Have we seen so many people caution them, not necessarily say we hate them, but was, they're saying, this is not the path to toe. Again, I'm, I'm sure that some people say, who are you to tell us what to do? But if we are looking towards a new Nigeria, should we be creating enemies? Um, being honest, understanding the political ter terrain, I need to say something. The same way APC taught in 20, the APC in 2015 promised change. They told a very, very violent path. Um, it's clear that Nigeria's trajectory in politics to change things must be violent because not violent, I don't support any of this, but when I mean violent, I mean verbally. And that is because we have grown to become a society that thrives on such violent interactions. Nigerians do not easily communicate, you know, in the best ways without using insultive words. And this comes from both sides. Uh, virtually, if, you, if, 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 we, if we had in the studio now somebody from the APC and somebody from the PDP on this side, it would be like having two Alsatians and a, a bone in between. Uh, that's what will happen. So that's what's, what has become our politics. That's what the mm -hmm. politics we created. And that's the politics that everybody So do we play. wait to have a hero? Because, and I use the word hero loosely here, to be able to sanitize the system, to change the narrative that you have said that had been, you know. Uh, do we wait for one person or should we be looking within to see how we can change the narrative as opposed to waiting for one person to come and help us, you know, tell that lie? The truth about Nigeria is that we're going to have multiple heroes. You're going to have a hero in your local government. You're going to have a hero in your ward. You're going to have a hero in your state. But we're not yet at that point. We still have those heroes are around. The problem with Nigeria is that 
we do not know what greatness is and we affirm greatness to people that don't deserve to be great and that's the greatest mistake we make always and that's why we end up following somebody like a sheep and then finding out that he's not actually what we bargained for and and you find yourself in that situation multiple times so till nigerians become politically literate enough to understand okay i'm following the senate senator why because he proposed and passed 35 bills in one year in office then that will be someone to follow not following someone that has been 16 years in the Senate and is flouting the same electoral act by buying two, two presidential form, a presidential form and a senatorial form. No mm. offense to my dimension. <laughs> Finally, you talked about political education. Um, the media, of course, has its job cut out for it. The NOA, which is half past dead. Um, we have other civil societies and, and you know, the civic space is large and it's asking for more hands to do justice to the voter education and civic education. Um, how much of that ground do you think we've been able to cover as we prepare for 2023? I'll be honest, um, the CSOs have done a lot of work. I would say there are a few CSOs on doing the work, like we always put out. There are a few media on doing the work especially when they cannot differentiate between an aspirant and a candidate, which you find sometimes in the media. Um, the fact that we only seem to bring two parties to a particular room instead of, as the Electoral Act demands, every, if any candidate is given 10 minutes, every other candidate participating in that election must be granted 10 minutes. So because we are politically illiterate, selling an education by illiterate people politically to very illiterate people politically is a problem. Hmm. How do we, again, because September 28th is just around the corner, um, how much ground do you think we can cover? Because again, I have seen civil society organizations campaign for a person. And it makes me really wonder if these are civil society, just as you said. Um, again, how can Nigerians be pointed in the right direction in terms of the civic education? We do it here on, on, on Plus TV. We do it every day. Um, we talk about these issues and allow people to you know, understand. We break it down. But not everybody watches television. Not everybody listens to the radio. So are we taking it to them? I, I'll be honest. Um, I used to be of the perception that not everybody gets the message. But I realized when you want to find out that um, Davido is doing giveaway. Even if you are in any corner in Nigeria, you will know about it. So Nigeria selectively, Nigerians selectively do not think they don't know politics. Mm. They assume they know, and the biggest mistake is they assume they actually know more than they think they know. Mm -hmm. Like there's the there's the myth of, ah, don't vote for a smaller party because a smaller party cannot win election. Okay, fine, that's a myth. Now, the reason why I have to dispel that myth here is because if that were true, why do the two big parties spend so much time vote buying and boxing and seizing ballot boxes and continue? Anyway, the new Electoral Act has pushed out coalition centers, so they've lost that for war on that front. But th therein lies the problems. We have myths within our culture which makes us think that some things are not possible. We don't even know what a senator or a house of rep actually does. People will tell you, ah, I can call my house of rep, that means he's working. No. You have people that have served, costing Nigeria over 2 billion naira in allowances for about 16 years and have not passed one bill. That is a problem. Mm. It's interesting. It's a conversation that we must continue to have, of course, as we get ready for the elections. Kunle Lawal is the executive director of the Electoral College of Nigeria. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about the Niger Delta, especially the South-South. And, of course, uh, what a former uh, diplomat had to say about the deficits in leadership in the South-South. Stay with us.